Welcome to Diffuse Congruence. This is episode 36 of the American Muslim Experience. My name is Zaki Hassan, and joining me once again is Pervez Ahmed. Hey, welcome back, listeners. Uh, good to be back, and uh, good to be talking to you, Zaki. How are things? Uh, things are pretty good, keeping busy, but I'm uh, excited to sit down and have this conversation. That's right. Uh, we've been having a pretty good track record of being pretty consistently on top of uh, lining up guests, which for us is always a blessing. And uh, sort of well, well, now that you jinxed it. <laughs> I know, right? But, yeah. Uh, we'll be seeing you guys in about two months, guys. Yeah, exactly. Way to hang a lampshade on it. Um, <laughs> so, so our guest for this episode is Joe Bradford. Joe Bradford is an author, entrepreneur, and American scholar of Islamic studies. He holds a graduate degree in Islamic law from Medina University and has worked professionally in finance for the past 10 years. He's the author of Simple Zakat Guide and The Muslim Money Guide. He currently teaches at Prairie View A&M University and runs his own advisory. He blogs at joebradford.net. Joe, thanks so much for joining us here on Diffuse Congruence. No, thank you so much for having me. So Joe is uh, one of those guests, again, I, I know I probably say this a lot, but uh, I, I really mean it here because uh, not only do I go way back with Joe, but I, I've wanted to have Joe on the, sh- on the show forever now um, because, one, I you know consider him – Sort of someone that I consider an expert in, in a lot of fields that I that I find fascinating and interesting, and at the same time, um, so uh, just someone who I think has a very unique and compelling story. Uh, Joe, what is it like? Twenty years, I think, man. We, you and I, kind of go back, like, yeah, close to that, yeah, <laughs> yeah, dating ourselves here. Uh, so yeah, um, kind of, uh, yeah, I'd love to sort of pick up where your story picks up. So you are, uh, am I right in saying you're originally from Florida? I am originally from Detroit, but I grew up in Florida. Okay. Oh, Detroit. I did not even know that. Um, so you were born and spent how many years in – early years in Detroit? So I was born in Detroit, and I lived there until I was about six, seven years old, um, almost eight. And then, uh, and then we moved down, lived in South Carolina for a few years. And then majority of my middle school, high school, or the, you know, early adulthood was in Florida. Got it, got it. Um, and and you're sort of uh, that like in, I guess your earliest memories are probably that of Detroit, but probably not too too uh, say, you know salient in terms of uh, re- really remembering a lot of the details growing up there. Uh, yeah, I mean I, I do have memories. We we would go back and visit a few times when we moved down south, um, and and I've been up there since you know to to visit family and things like that. So um, wow. there are some memories, but it's not as not as vibrant as my memories in Florida, definitely. Yeah, yeah, certainly. Um, so I guess uh, tell us a little bit about like the, the like the family background, like uh, maybe also like like religious background. I mean, were you kind of um, you know uh, really heavily religiously influenced family? Not so much. Uh, we were that kind of family that woke up on Sunday. You know, you know, my mom would say, you know, Easter's coming up, and everybody's going to get up and put on their Easter best, and we're going to go to church. And then when Easter Sunday came, we all slept in and wake up and made like waffles and pancakes and just said, yeah, maybe next year. So <laughs> we, we weren't really, we weren't, my parents weren't particularly uh, church going or religious. I, 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 however, used to go to church quite frequently with my neighbors. That exposed me to a wide array of experiences within, um, within the Christian religious experience. So yeah. Everything yeah. from, you know, Catholicism to Mormonism and everything in between. Which is what I was going to ask. So it wasn't any particular denomination, per se, that you attended or frequently? Well, uh, well, I was baptized as a Southern Baptist. Okay. At the age of 11 or 12. I can't even remember now. But, um, but yeah, I was going to church with, uh, with our neighbors. In, in, uh, now I had, to been, I had to have been at least 10, 10 or 11, going to church with our neighbors in South Carolina. And um, decided to get uh, baptized. So tell us about that a little bit, like, especially I think for the sake of, I mean, like I know for, for my own background, like just for the sake of a lot of our Muslim listeners who might not know just sort of what, what an event, it, you know, um, uh, or a rite of passage back to like baptism, baptism, excuse me, is, um, what does it sort of, uh, what does it signify? I guess is, is, is the right question. Uh, it signifies entering into a covenant with God. Um, and, and, and doing, you know, following in the footsteps of Jesus, because Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist in the River Jordan. 
uh, and you know dedicated his life to God. And so when when somebody gets baptized, they do the same thing, and it's supposed to be you know a I guess a a entry into the you know washing away of one's sins and things like that and the way it was explained to me at the time is that it's very symbolic it doesn't mean you're going to be a perfect person but it's a it's a turning over of a new page a turning of a new leaf you know that type of thing got it now is the ritual different depending on what denomination you are yeah some uh some churches the church that i went to did full body submersion so Mm -hmm. i I actually had they they would like have like a little mini spa like jacuzzi pool thing in the back of the church, and it opened up to curtains that would open on to the congregation, and then the water would be prepared, and you know it was holy water. It had been blessed and prayed over, and there was these odd bubbles that were coming out of it, and then um, you know the you wear all white garments, and they uh, the the pastor would hold you by the back of the head, and then plug your nose and dunk you into the water. Um, and almost in like a free falling kind of fashion, other churches, however, they'll just do like a sprinkling of water over the head or just wash the head or something like that. So it really depends on, on where you are. Right, right, right. Um, and so, um, then, so a- a- after that baptism at that very early age, um, uh, like I think you, you already mentioned, you used to sort of attend church with your neighbors, um, I, I guess then the, the, the like the next question to ask would be then what sort of I guess took you out of Christianity in terms of like okay I, maybe I want to search for something else or maybe the answers that I seek whatever those answers may be or the sorry those questions may be um, you know can be found outside of Christianity. Well, I, I don't know if it was necessarily um, something that took me outside of Christianity, but I had. I had always known from reading the Bible that there were prophecies about others to come after Jesus. And the way we were told in church was, well, that just means the Apostle Paul and his disciples and, you know, those that followed the church, the church fathers. But it just the, the history and the and the the phrases and things like that, they just didn't really match up. And so, um, you know, when I was 14 years old, uh, we were living in Florida at that time. I uh, I just, you know, randomly came across the mention of Islam in a magazine article and it piqued my interest and I started to uh, started to research it. And that was kind of my first exposure to anything Islam and Muslims. I mean, I had known about being from Detroit. I had known about, you know, as uh, I don't know, you guys bleep stuff on the show. Um, we can, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, those damn Arabs taking our jobs. I mean, I heard that a lot when I was little because there's a huge Arab population in, uh, deep, in Detroit, Dearborn, Ann Arbor. Sure. And, you know, you go to the VFW, you know, the, the veterans of foreign wars, you know, um, uh, lounge, and, uh, you're going to hear your relatives, you know, talking about not being able to get jobs because of, uh, people taking their jobs. And so that was at that time, that was what people would say, but I had never heard about their faith. I had never heard about, you know, anything that had to do with Islam. So this magazine article is kind of the first, uh, the first intro to it. So, so we're, we're, we're now, now in, in what time period? Roughly? Uh, this is about 1990. Oh, wow. Okay. So yeah. 1980. So this is still, I mean, I guess it is Islam, I guess for I guess for at least a segment of the population, Islam is uh, at least linked to global terrorism, but not as say you know as poignantly so as as it would be after the say say the first World Trade Center bombing or something. Uh, no, I don't think that it had necessarily um, been been as linked at that point. I think if I recall around you know eighty eight, eighty nine, ninety. Global terrorism was really look at, looked at as a Latin American experience or, or as a Latin American phenomenon. You had, you know, Carlos the Jackal and um, a few other, uh, you know, that were known for international terrorists and, and, and wanted by Interpol. Um, I think it was, you know, the the he, he, the escalation in the Middle East and then the subsequent, you know, um, first um, first uh, first Gulf War that kind of brought, you know, Islam Muslims in the Middle East into the, into the limelight. I mean, I still remember clear as day, uh, this, uh, this lyric from, you know, Eric B. Rakim, there's a song called casualties of war. Right. 
And I had, uh, you know, I had accepted Islam at that time, and it, it had already, you know, because when I was in the the first the first World Trade Center bombing happened while I was in high school, and I remember being taunted, you know, the next day at school because of it, um, and, and and saying, you know, this is what you've joined, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but there's this line he says, you know, kamikaze pilots seeking re- re- seeking revenge for Saddam, um, you know, about you know flying flying airplanes into the world trade center and you know kamikaze pilots seeking revenge for saddam so um my friends and i used to used to joke that you know bush must have you know been a big eric b and rakim fan um to uh, implicate iraq for uh for 9-11 but, uh, <laughs> right interesting right but yeah that was i mean it was around that uh, around that around that time that okay. uh that i found the magazine article and then I kept reading, you know, this is the age before the internet. I mean, the internet was only at like a few universities and, and military um, establishments at that time. And so, you know, we, we did what, you know, what the old folks did. And I was actually went to the library and read books. Um, And I, uh, you know, I have a friend named, I have a friend named Justin. It's funny. I, uh, a good guy lives in, in Florida, Georgia. Uh, we were talking about, you know, well, how did you find out about Islam? And he asked me how to find out about Islam. I told him, yeah, you know, I, I read it in a magazine article. Then I had to go to like five different public libraries and try to find books. And then my school library, my new high school, finally had a good book by Ken Morgan. And I read that. It was like a whole, you know, year, year and a half. And I was like, what about you? He's like, dude, I found a, set, a website on StumbleUpon. <laughs> so it's the completely, you know, the, the, the difference of experience is uh, right pretty amazing that that's true that's true um so what was it then you know that that sort of intrigued you um about islam and 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 you know sort of leads to the for you deciding that you want to convert uh for me it was just clarity of the whole thing i mean it was like okay five things you do those five things you go to paradise and they're pretty simple there's a lot of self-responsibility you know pray to god worship him you know, do, you know, give charity, uh, pray, uh, fast, you know, for your own sake, be a good person. Uh, you know, it, it just seemed, I think one of the big, and, and I've experienced this in speaking with friends and family and, and just random people on the street when, when they know that I'm a Muslim is sometimes for the average American irreligious or semi-religious person, because, because religion in so so much of modern religion is seen as burdensome and it's seen as something which is beyond comprehension it has to be this you know this supernatural enigma and if it's not then it's not real religion so when you tell them islam is really simple you know just god is one worship him follow his prophets done it's like no dude it cannot be that simple i need more detail like why you know, what, what else do you do? It's like, no, that's the very, very basic, you know, essence of faith in Islam. Right. Um, yeah. So, you know, for me, it was the simplicity. I was looking for the, the simplicity of it. Right. And, and, and even in things, you know, as far as things like salvation go, it's certainly much more of a, like you said, a very, a much more simplistic understanding of, of, or approach, I should say, not understanding, but approach to that as, you know, unlike say Christianity, where it's, you know, the, you know, Christ and the salvation, you know, and, and, and Christ taking on the sins of humanity and how that, you know, and accepting Christ into your life and so on. Right. Yeah. And, 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 you know, and then which church do you go to? Cause depending, you know, depending upon which church you go to, Jesus is God or he's the son of God or he's, you know, both, uh, and that adds to the confusion. And then, you know, how are you saved? Are you saved through actions? Are you saved through grace? Um, you know, there, there's that, there's that whole angle there that, uh, differs quite greatly between, you know, Catholics and Protestants and even amongst Protestant sects, or should I say denominations? Right. Um, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, by, by all means, I, I don't want the listeners to think I'm no scholar in Christianity. And, uh, you know, I don't want to anyone to think that I've misrepresented, um, you know, their faith, but I'm pre- purely speaking from my own experience. No, I, I think that's a great point. Um, however, I mean, I, I think you are a scholar of Islam. I mean, I consider you as such, and, and you certainly have the pedigree and the credentials for that. Um, I, I'd love to 
get your thoughts on this idea of of salvation of of because you mentioned salvation through is it one is it is it through one's actions or is it through grace? Uh, would you agree that even within Islam, though, there is that element of because this is something that I, you know, when I speak, especially to non-Muslim audiences, you know, sort of always have to make the asterisk point about because there is still this element of grace even within Islam, right? It's not just based purely on one's actions or deeds alone and faith alone, correct? Yeah, definitely. Um, and I think that the, the finer detail, because if you just say, oh, yeah, it's just like, you know, you're just, your salvation is based on grace— um, okay, then, then why should I, why should I accept another faith? Why should I change anything that I'm doing? Why should I even become a, a better person? Right. Um, and, and you know, the Prophet Ali Sallallahu Hadith is in the Sahih. He said, um, he said, لا يذكر الجنة أحدكم بعمله. None of you will enter paradise by, um, by, by virtue of his actions. They said, not even you, O Messenger of God. He said, not even I, or not even me. Uh, only if God envelopes me in his mercy. Right. And so um, that's the hadith that I, like for me, that's the asterisk, right? Because yeah. to me, it's like, yeah, it's, it's, you know, because again, in, you know, time and time again, the Quran talks about faith and good works, but then you have that, like to me, you have got this very authentic statement of the prophet, even saying, you know, even his, even, even his own salvation is not but by the grace of God. Right, that God envelops him in His mercy and grace, and and there's this, I mean, there's this caveat to that, right? So how do you reconcile between this idea of you know God's grace and mercy entering us into paradise, and then as you mentioned, all of these verses in the in the Quran that talk about you know faith and good deeds, and it's really to say that part of God's grace is that He is that He um, He guides you to good deeds. Um, and that's definitely a sign of his grace uh, and, and whether that, you know, whether that occurs lifelong or that happens a moment before you pass, um, you know, that's completely up to him. But, you know, a man came to the prophet and he asked him, um, you know, are, are the things that we do newly created every day? Are they, are they things which are, you know, just kind of are created out of, out of nothingness or are they, um, are they, you know are they are they uh, things which have been decided previously and he said excuse me they've been decided previously so the well then why should we act he said act for everyone will be facilitated for that which he was created for so it's kind of like the Tao of Islam right mm. that you know you you act in the way which is easiest for you and most beneficial for yourself and others and you know that Taoist philosophy is that, you know, if you are really good at being a butcher and instead of being a butcher, you're trying to be an engineer, you're kind of going against the path that life has set for you. So you need to go and be a butcher and be the best butcher that you can. Um, whereas if you are great, really great at being an engineer, then you need to do that. And if we kind of port that over to the idea of actions, you know, we that's why we see you know, verses in the Quran like, um, what's the verse? Subul uh, salam is the, the, the end of the verse. Yahdi bihi ladina aminu subul salam I'm drawing a blank on the exact Arabic right now. But, you know, he guides those to his pathways of peace. And in the exegesis and explanations of these verses, it says, the pathways of peace mean that you know, like a highway, there's lots of roads and lots of people drive lots of different cars, but they're all going in the same direction. That's um, right. So, you know, you, you, you look for those actions that are going to keep you on the straight and narrow, but there's always this lurking. And this is the, 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 the main point, not to linger on too long, but the main point that I always get asked about when I speak to interfaith crowds is, well, if you believe that and you believe that the actions are not necessarily qualifiers and that one, you know, they're just a, a sign of God's grace, then, you know, uh, don't you believe that you're going to heaven? And why don't you have certainty? You know, we as Christians, we have certainty that Jesus has forgiven, of our, forgiven, of a, forgiven us of our sins. Why don't you have that certainty? We say, well, you know, I think that the beauty of Islamic theology is that we don't have that, that certainty about our salvation. 
Um, we, we know that we know that we can be saved by the grace of God, but we don't know if we qualify for the grace of God at all times, because, you know, it's like, it's like going around and saying, you know, I really just, you know, I, I, I have an honor, honorary degree from Harvard, even though uh, Harvard knows nothing of me and I've never met any threshold for action that they, but, but I've really got, one, you know, right. Um, it, it, it's, uh, you know, that's that, that, that uncertainty, I think, is what kind of keeps you always self-correcting and keeps yourself accountable. And and that plays into a lot of what draw, drew me into the faith is the idea of personal responsibility, which, you know, there's a lot more that could be said about that. Oh, certainly, certainly. Um, and so now, 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 now you take it upon yourself now that, that, that so conversion for you. That is to say, converting to Islam. Reversion, brother. Oh, so, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> so Joe said reversion, which is, I think, a really fascinating conversation. But maybe, maybe we'll come back to that. How about that? Sure, um, sure. that because I, I think, I think something maybe, per, you know, should I was be, just joking. Well, well you right. know what? Why don't Why don't we go down that that yeah, uh, sure. order and then circle back? Yeah. So talk about that, Joe. I mean, like you know, and and if I may, like as a revert or convert right <laughs> i would love your thoughts on that like this whole idea of no no brother it's reversion to islam not conversion i i, I said it in jest i really think it's ridiculous when people insist on that type of thing yeah. um, i always joke with people people say to me brother you know did you convert to islam or did you revert to islam and i said no i loverted to islam <laughs> and they're like what's that you know like, i listen to lots of 80s and 90s R&B, and then, you know, Gerald Levert and the Levert family, and that was what wow. guided me to Islam. And I always get this really odd look from people. And I say, you know, when, when, I, when they, they're, you know, sufficiently bewildered at what I'm talking about, because most people don't know who Levert is, um, I just say, look, man, it, it really doesn't matter. I accepted Islam as my personal faith, and I think that's fine to say is that someone accepted Islam. Right. Um, there's, there's a lot of semantics that happen in the Muslim community that really just draw away from the the core issues at hand. Um, you know, is this word used or is that word used? Well, you know, and I mean, at the end of the day, did you do it or not? You know? Yeah. Yeah. No, that's an excellent point. I, I you know, yeah, I, I think that's should be the probably the final point made on that. Um, uh, or final statement on that on that issue. Um, but what I wanted to ask you was, so for you, I mean, it wasn't, you know, like you, you, you embrace the faith, you begin practicing, but what then was the impetus to say, you know, for, for yourself to make the decision that, you know what, for me at least, it's not just going to be enough for me to just, you know, practice the faith and, and, and do the best I can. I would really like to study Islam, uh, you know, on a scholarly uh, you know, on a scholarly level, what was that impetus or drive? So there was two things. Um, one has to do with kind of before Islam, you know, I was, you know, uh, what, you know, 13, 14 years old. I used to, you know, I saved up money. I bought like the latest book on the Dead Sea Scrolls. I started looking into like Aramaic and in Hebrew and, and, you know, I, I was infatuated with languages and I said, you know, if I could read the Bible and the language that Jesus spoke, I could really get down to the bottom of this. Um, and it was around that time that I, that I found out about Islam. And then when I became Muslim, I said to myself, you know, one of the first things I have to do is learn the Arabic language, because if the Quran is written in the Arabic language, um, that means it's accessible to me. Um, and I don't have to go through a translator. And it's funny, I actually had, okay, so you know how most mosques have like um, uh, Nurani Qaeda, yeah. Or Baghdad I don't know which one you guys read on it learned on. It was the Nura, yeah. 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 So so we, we had one in our mosque, it was called Yasarn al Quran. Yasarn al Quran, of course, yeah. That's the one my kids use now, for example. Yeah. So so I was given Yasarn al Quran and I was told this is the Quran. So I actually like for like six months to eight six to eight months, almost a year, I carried that around like wrapped in a piece of cloth and I thought it was <laughs> I was like, wow! I was like, this is the most amazing book. I mean, you right. know, they it starts from the letters and it ends with the chapters. That's mm-hmm. so cool, right? 
Mm-hmm. And then one day, this brother from Ghana named Ishaq, he stopped me and he's like, do you have a, do you have a Quran? I was like, yeah, I got a Quran. It's really nice. It's white, it's thin. He was like, thin? That's <laughs> right. <laughs> and then he gave me the Abdullah Yusuf Ali translation. Um, yeah. So, so for me, it was kind of the 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 desire to learn the Quran in the language that it was revealed in, uh, and then there was the advice of an older brother, an elderly brother, may Allah have mercy on him. He was a um, he had accepted Islam in maybe the fifties. His name was Curtis Shabazz. He passed away in Jacksonville, Florida, um, and he uh, the first janaza or the first funeral that I ever prayed uh, over. Um, and, uh, you know, he, he used to come to Sunday school with his wife. His wife was a Sunday school teacher and, uh, he, he would, you know, he, his wife would drive there. He was so weak from cancer that well, by the time he would get to the, to the masjid, he, he couldn't enter the door because he just, you know, couldn't get out of the car. So, um, I used to go and sit with him in the car and spend time with him and talk with him. And, and he really encouraged me to go and study. He said, you know, there are places all around the world where Muslims have centers of learning and you should start applying to them and start to, you know, go out and learn this faith for yourself. He goes, my generation, we did as much as we could. You have, a, you know, a lot more resources uh, available to you, you know, take a, you know, avail yourself of those ref- resources and go out there and learn. And, and he's really kind of the, you know, I, I credit everything that I've done uh, to him and that one little piece of advice in a car, uh, you know, on a, hot Florida afternoon one one Sunday. Wow. Wow. Inspiration comes. Yeah. Uh, when we least expect it, but that's, 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 that's amazing. You know, God, God, God bless him indeed. Um, and so what then, um, made you decide on the university of Medina? Was it more utilitarian? Like it just, you know, you, you got accepted and you went, or was it purposeful, like intentional, I guess I should say. Well, uh, I had applied to a lot of different universities. I applied to Al-Azhar. I applied to Jamt al-Bayt, Al-Bayt University in Jordan. Right. I applied to the Islamic University of Islamabad. Um, at that time, Malaysia just seemed like way too far away from home. Yeah. Um, I applied to Mecca and I applied to Medina. And I was looking into Syria for some of the, the ma'ahid or the institutes that were there. And, you know, I... Uh, bright, you know, bright-eyed young American lad that I was, um, thought that there was some semblance of order in much, many of these institutions, and I would get a rejection letter. And so, uh, you know, never hearing back from any of these universities, um, I was kind of like, you know, thinking to myself, what's going on? Why, you know, yeah. why aren't I hearing about, you know, back from them? And uh, and, and and so, um, you know, years passed and I had applied to different places. Some of them, you know, uh, wanted money, uh, which I just didn't have. And um, when the opportunity came to go to Medina, which was a full scholarship, uh, you know, came about, I, I took that. Um, and so uh, that's kind of how I, you know, to live in the city of the Prophet is, is a great uh, blessing and honor. Uh, and then also to, to have your, your college paid for you is, is as well. Right, right. Now, I mean, yeah, I was gonna. We, we we can talk about this now. We can talk about this later. But I mean, I I, I did want to get your thoughts on what some perceive to be sort of the ideological frame that is off that that, that is presented or you know at, at the University of Medina. Um, right. You know. Um, so maybe talk a little bit about that. I mean, you, like, like your thoughts on that. Um, I know this is something you and I have talked on and talked about at length, uh, in private, but just, yeah, for the sake of the listeners. Right. Well, I mean, you know, it, it, the university of Medina is located in Saudi Arabia. Um, and so, you know, our university has, um, a very Salafi influence on uh, that can be, cannot be denied. Um, it was established with, you know, by scholars from all over the Muslim world, uh, you know, after the Saudiization process, obviously, that the number of non-Saudis teaching in the university diminished. Um, right. But, you know, I think like any university, uh, there's going to be an ideological slant. I think like any university in the United States, there's going to be, um, you know, you're going to have conservative, more conservative leaning or or uh, liberal leaning uh, universities. And right. uh, the University of Medina is really no different. Um, but I think that one one thing that happens with a lot of people is they seem to paint everyone's experiences with the same brush. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, I can say definitely that kind of many of the very public 
uh, enunciations of what Medina is like by people who, who have and have not been there, or I can say that my diff my experiences personally have been um, markedly different than anything that they've experienced. And 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 you know it's it's important not to not to generalize. Um, you know, based on that, I had a, a gentleman tell me a few months ago, he said, you know, you're, you're not like anybody else from Medina that I've ever met. And I said, well, you know, how many people from Medina have you actually met? And he's yeah. like, you know, come to think of it, none, you're the first. He's like, okay, well, that explains it. <laughs> Fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I, I guess also, I mean, like for the sake of our listeners, I mean, I, I imagine everyone has sort of heard the term, but it's it's so loaded. But maybe, you know, maybe talk a little bit about that sort of uh, the Salafi ideology that 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 tends to be pervasive in the kingdom, you know, in in Saudi Arabia and other countries as well, but uh, but in Saudi Arabia in particular. Well, I think you know the, the, these terms in general across the Muslim world are they can be loaded terms and they can be yeah. elastic terms. Um, I'm sorry, yes. can you repeat that? You said loaded and? Elastic. Right. And, you know, so, you know, if you, one area of interest that I read up on from time to time and I follow, you know, Twitter feeds and, and blogs of and, you know, academic papers is the whole idea of like ideological influences on international terror. And when you read this information, you know, there's always this talk about, you know, Salafi jihadi, jihadi, these type of, you know, terms that are used. Right. But it's almost used. interchangeably. Yeah. What's that? I said almost interchangeably, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah and, and, and it doesn't take into consideration the the differences of uh, you know within you know with within the people that use that term. You know, it's kind of like saying that, you know, um all the Sufis are the same. And then, you know, you 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 that that includes the militant Sufi militias that are fighting against, you know, both the Somali government and the Shabab in, in Somalia right now. A lot of people don't know about the, them. Um, the uh, the Naqshbandi army, which uh, merged with ISIS. A lot of people, you know, don't pay attention to that. And then, you know, you know, uh, 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 dervishes that, you know, uh, dance in the squares of, of Morocco or, you know, are in the, the, um, the uh, the madrasas uh, in, in in Turkey, uh, you know that that's a very a very broad um, brush to paint with, and people, you know, have different approaches and different uses of the same term. Um, it, it brings to mind that you know one of my one of our teachers who was an early graduate from Medina, who was from Mali originally, uh, he was a teacher outside of the university, not inside the university. But um, I studied uh, studied grammar and a few um, texts of Arabic literature with him. But he, you know, he told us that they graduate the um, the uh, the degrees, the diplomas from from the University of Medina used to say, you know, we we give this ijaza, this license to sheikh, and then it would have like an you know an empty spot, and they write your name in, right? <laughs> and so they were they were um, petitioned by students from Africa to take the word sheikh out. And huh. you're like, you're like, why? Like, you know, you've proven yourself. You know, you've passed the gauntlet. You've, you know, you've thrown down the mantle. You've passed your exams and shown that you know this stuff. And you're like, yeah, but sheikh in our countries means magician. So <laughs> we go back to our country, and they're like, these guys, you know, these villagers are like, you know, seeing a a a, a, a diploma printed on paper from some foreign country saying, you know, oh, he went all the way to Saudi Arabia to study sorcery. Right. You know? um, it's you know it's like trying to teach it would be like trying to go to an American mosque and teach people about Islam and saying I'm a graduate of Hogwarts. Um, you know, <laughs> right, right. People would probably think it's cool, but it wouldn't go over well with a lot of people. So that's right. That's right. So even the, even the, like even terms that we take for granted um, tend to be loaded uh, or not loaded, but just to have di different meanings in different contexts. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah, and and right. so I think that there's a you know, there's a polemical use of usage of those terms. There's a there's an academic usage of those terms. Um, there's one, you know, even in many of the books, uh, uh, biographies, you'll find the word Salafi to be used as a superlative, um, meaning that the person was 
you know, stringent in, 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 in trying to follow what he had, you know, found narrated from past generations. But that, that person himself was still that person that prayed all night and that made dhikr all day and that followed a madhab. Um, and so, you know, I think that we, we, without getting, going too far down that, because that's a whole other conversation itself, it, it, it really speaks to the level of our own cultural literacy in the Muslim community. Mm. You know, one of the one of the things that a friend of mine said to me, I really think rings true, is he said, you know, our problem in, in the community is that we only know the last 50 years of Islamic history and the first 50 years. <laughs> and everything else in between is kind of lost on people. So we're fighting about these names and these approaches. And in reality, you know, we're we're fighting about things that are quite new or they re- you know, new using old names or their names are being used for, uh, you know, to attribute self, oneself to a sacred history, like Sherman Jackson, you know, calls it, um, when in reality, the reality is, is quite different. Um, so I think that there has to be a bit more maturity and a lot more literacy on these topics to be able to speak to them. Otherwise, you know, uh, it's, it's kind of, uh, you know, for me at least, you know, seeing seeing kind of the whole Salafi movement thing that happened in the 90s, right? And right. everyone did cry that and say, you know, it was overly harsh, it was overly, you know, it was backwards, it was tying the American Muslim community to a cultural standard which was not relevant to uh, American life. And I say, yeah, I agree. But then we're finding that again in the United States with what's being touted as Sufism or traditionalism. Traditional Islam, right? You know, and yeah. I went to Isna this past year and I went to the bazaar and it's like going back in time, you know, like a decade, but it's just, you know, um, Ahi became Sidi, you know? Hmm. Yeah, everybody used to be Ahi in the 90s and now everybody's Sidi. And everybody used to wear the red shimag on their head, and now they just wear it on their shoulder. That's I, so I, true. I, I always joke, and I, I, I'm semi-serious about this. I'm going to write a book. I'm going to call it, like, The History of Islam in America Through Hats. <laughs> <laughs> and so it'll be like, like in Zeki's avatar, I'll have his hat, like, featured in, uh, Which, in, in one of the chapters. Yeah, it's fedora. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> or it's his fedora as well. And, you know, you look, it's like, you know, you got the Fez and the Fez went to, you know, the, the Sudanese turban and the Sudanese turban went to the Kufi and the Kufi went to the Shimab and the Shimab went to the, you know, to the Syrian, you know, to this. And mm-hmm. now it's this whole Turkish influence that's coming into the U.S. And, you know, when are the Malaysians going to get their day and we're going to wear their cool hats and 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 everybody's kind of searching outside themselves for this savior, if you will. Uh, uh, that 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 saves their identity from something that they feel is is diminishing it or pulling pulling it away. Mm. I think that's fascinating. Uh, wow, that's a that's a, that's a lot to talk about there. <laughs> but um, maybe kind of uh, well, I don't know. I mean, maybe maybe, maybe moving on is it a little bit. Um, so you at, at you see you complete your studies and then you come back to the United States. No, you don't. You, you don't. You have a stop in the Gulf for a little bit longer. After so, your- so, so I complete my studies in the bachelor's program. I apply to the master's program in law. Uh, alhamdulillah, I was the first American um, that was accepted into the graduate program of law in Medina. Um, and I complete. And while I was completing my master's, I got hired by an international bank, and uh, I worked in banking there in the Middle East for about three and a half years. And then by the, what was it, the beginning of 2012, I was back in the States. I was actually planning to continue um, in the Middle East, but my, you know, my, after conversations with family and friends, and we just decided that it was time to come back. Uh, my, my mother was kind of adamant on having us back stateside, and so we, we moved back and lived in Florida for about a year, year and a half, um, and then, you know, ended up in Texas after that. Right, right. Um, so was it something in particular in your studies that uh, either 
drew you to banking? Like, like I guess, like, would, it, would it be Islamic finance in particular, or what was the nature of the bank? Uh, yeah, it was an Islamic finance bank. It was one of the, 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 the main Islamic finance banks in Saudi Arabia, and that had gone from beyond, you know, it had gone beyond being just a local bank to, um, to establishing itself as an international brand. And so, um, you know, I, I had I've, since high school, I, you know, every year in high school, I was part of the, you know, the stock market game. Um, you know, one year my team came in second. Um, the teacher told us, yeah, you're actually first because, you know, the, the, the kids that got first place were actually from um, West Palm Beach and all their dads are investment advisors anyway. So they were cheating. Um, <laughs> so. Uh, so, you know, I, I've always been in, in, interested in these um, in these ideas <clears throat> and the the idea to kind of focus on issues of Muslims and money and halal and haram as far as banking and finance started actually before Medina. Mm -hmm. I um, I was living here in Houston and I went to, you know. Um, for the listeners at home that may not know, you know, we, 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 we didn't have, you know, Skype and, you know, uh, Google Hangouts and YouTube and stuff like that. A lot of times if you wanted to have a lecture, you know, you'd have a telelink and, you know, AT&T would give you a conference number, 15, you know, 10 to 15 mosques would pitch in and, uh, you know, pay a couple hundred dollars each and they'd have some scholar from overseas on the line and everybody would call in with pre, you know, pre-registered uh, questions and, you know, listen um, to these questions being answered or have a lecture. So, um, uh, so there was a, there was a scholar who will remain nameless that, uh, you know, this list long laundry list of, of financial issues for Muslims in the West was asked of, and everything was just like, you know, question one, haram, question two, haram, question three, haram, question four, mm, uh, maybe, but probably haram, you know? <laughs> so, so I remember this, older gentleman, uh, uh, Syrian gentleman uh, came up after the, uh, after the lecture and he was like, what, what is this? Everything is haram. Is there no halal? I mean, what are we supposed to do? I have seven children. I'm supposed to live in an apartment complex. Uh, and, it, and it was the, it was kind of the passion in his belief that there has to be something out there that's allowed and his frustration and everybody just saying that everything was wrong that right. said to me, I said to myself, I should probably investigate this. And that kind of started it for me. So when the opportunity came while I was basically waiting for my, my uh, thesis defense to, to start work, I jumped on it. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, and I know that some of you, a lot of your writings are, are um, uh, usually finance and, and just, uh, whether it's more than the stock market, market uh, interest bearing. Yeah. Yeah. Because, you know, the, the one thing that I found is that all of the conversations about Islamic finance that come from the Muslim world, and I worked in that, I worked in, I worked in corporate finance, I worked in project, you know, syndicated, you know, um, syndicated uh, loans and, and, and you know, um, corporate finance, project finance, mergers and acquisitions, um, you know, uh, the, the, the most probably the, the closest you get to consumer products is like the, you know, the mutual funds were starting over there. I was on a few mutual fund boards while I was at the bank. And, um, and the, the, everything is focused really on regulatory issues and very high level structures. Most of the questions that we have in the U S and in most countries, quite frankly, are issues that have to do with consumer finance retail finance and they're being they're being answered in a way that assumes that everything in the marketplace is forbidden um and that the you know kind of the the default is either no or compromise and to me forgive me you know based on my studies uh, that just number one does not seem to mesh well with the the scholarly tradition of Muhammadat of of transactional dealings in uh, Islamic law, and uh, number two, um, you know, it seems to go against the general precept that you know Islam is a is a faith uh, that is applicable at all times and all places. So if you know avoiding riba is a is a a issue of faith, 
you know, then, um, then we, we, we need to really investigate clearly and know, know definitively whether something is or is not riba. Uh, otherwise, we may be making people's lives unnecessarily difficult. Mm. Wow. Uh, <laughs> lot, to, lot to unpack in just what you said. Yeah, uh, you know, I, you know, a lot, um, I think one of the, one of the main questions that I get is about mortgages. Sure. And there's this, there's this, you know, everybody says all the, all the scholars agree that the mortgages, that mortgages are haram. I say, okay, well, fine. W- w- number one, who are those scholars? Nobody really knows. It's, you know, it's just kind of the proverbial. Just all of them. Just all of them. Yeah. I mean, the ones we could find anyway. <laughs> um, that, and it's not only that, it's, it's okay. You, you say to them, okay, fine. You know, all scholars agree, uh, agree. What do they agree on? Well, you know, these issues were brought to the scholars, the, which in, what they're referring to usually is the fifth Academy of OIC's 1977, um, uh, meeting in which a long list of questions were posed to them from triple IT in Herndon, Virginia. Hmm. One of those questions was, and if I recall verbatim, it's about two to three lines max. It says, we live in the United States. We are unable to continue renting long term. And the only way that we can purchase a home is by borrowing money from the bank and then um, paying interest on the loan. Is this permitted or not? So obviously, from the way that the, the question is phrased, all of the scholars there said, no, absolutely not. You can't do, you do money for more money later, you know, an unsecured, unsecured working capital loan. No, that's, that's definitely Riba. Uh, Sheikh Mustafa Zarqa, uh, may Allah have mercy on him, was the only dissenting opinion, scholar from Syria, Hanafi scholar from Syria. He said, I, I take the Hanafi opinion here that it's permissible to deal in Riba in non-Islamic lands, right. and, and especially in the face of, of necessity. Now, after that, everybody has been talking about the same two things, either taking this minority opinion of the Hanafi school or, or I'm sorry, this opinion of the Hanafi school or characterizing the issue as, as a necessity. And, and what I always ask people is, have you or any of the scholars that you referred to actually pulled out mortgage documents and read them cover to cover? Thank you. I mean, Parvez, you're you're a lawyer. You understand that, you know, um, hundreds of pages. Uh, you know, right. uh, you know, you know. There's so many different, you know, um, clauses and paras that are referring back to each other, and it's it's not it's not just a fly by night answer, and it's certainly not analogous to the way that the question was phrased. And from the conditions of fatwa and Islam, you know, to issue a religious edict is that. And for the for the e to be correct is that it has to it actually has to agree with the reality of what's being asked about. And you know, a secured mortgage, you know, a secured transaction like a mortgage is not uh, the same as saying I borrowed money and then I bought a home and then I paid it back in interest. That's right. That's right. It's, it's not, not a standard in, in bearing loan. Yes. Loan. yes. Yeah. Exactly. Go ahead. Sorry. No, I was going to say exactly. Yeah, thank you. No, no, please go ahead. Yeah. No, I mean, so, you know, my, my, my goal right now is now that I'm, I've been back in the States and I've been kind of, you know, educating myself on, on these issues and trying to, you know, um, navigate them. Um, and before I, you know, before I speak on any of them, have, you know, have speak, you know, speak to experts, speak to um, consumers, you know, educate myself personally, um, uh, and, 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 and kind of put all the cards on the table for everybody. Cause I think that one of the big things that's missing when we talk about all of these issues is that everybody goes, Oh, well, you know, mortgage is haram and uh business loan is haram and uh, having a bank account is haram and a credit card is haram. And so you have a lot of people, okay. That have a business loan, they have a mortgage, they have a credit card, they have, you know, whatever. Right. And guess what? You're telling them everything is haram. So, I mean, it's kind of like an all or nothing attitude. Well, hell, if it's all haram, I mean, you know, just forget about it. Let's just do whatever we want. And so by 
by not by not being judicious in our coverage of these issues, we're actually pushing people away from their own ethical um, standards that they, you know, in all other situations would not abandon, would not abandon. Meaning that, you know, if there's a diff, there's, you can say a person has a quote unquote Islamic mortgage and find they're doing it halal and a person has a conventional mortgage and find they're doing it haram. I don't agree with that characterization, but fine. But when you, when you consistently um, stigmatize the usage of financial instruments that they themselves, at least in my opinion, they're not enough research has been done on. You are creating them a mindset that, that, you know what, even the, 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 the ethical standards of consumption don't necessarily have to be followed because hey, it's all haram, haram anyway. Right. So who cares? So if I'm going to get a conventional loan, let's just, you know, do a double jumbo loan and get like the, you know, stretch my credit to the limit. And, uh, if it goes belly up, it goes belly up. Right. So I think even in, even in using a conventional loan, Islam can still speak to a person's, regardless of whether you say the conventional loan is impermissible or not, you should still be encouraging an individual to make a responsible ethical choice in his usage of the amount of credit which is extended to him. Am I, I don't know, I, I feel like I ran. No, no, I, I, I think you're, I, I think, I mean, it's obviously a complicated issue, but I think the way you're presenting it um, is in a way that I, I think for us, for, for a lot of listeners, they have they just haven't heard it presented this way because, like you said, it, you know, for for far too long now, around these conversations of of of, of, of whether it's the mortgage or even if it's like a student loan, so something more uh, the semblance of a traditional uh, loan, interest bearing loan. For far too long, we've adopted precepts of either this like like blanket okay you know it's it's all haram or you know adopting these like minority opinions within a particular school or the you know based on principles of and this necessity rather than coming up with real solutions that speak to the realities of life in forget about forget about an american context life in the modern world right yeah definitely so i i think i, I think you know yeah, it's going to be complicated no matter what. I mean, obviously, and I think for maybe uh, there, there's a chunk of the of, of the population of people, even or even our listeners, who a lot of this stuff is like okay, way over my pay grade, way over my head. But for those I think who are interested in the in the in the, in the subject matter, especially, I, I think are, are are finding what you're saying quite refreshing. To be honest with you, right? I mean, I, my, you know, my my advice, and I think you know, probably cap off with this. I yeah, I. I generally answer the question. Somebody asks me about getting a mortgage. I tell them, you have to ask yourself three questions. Number one, is this is this purchase going to contribute to the social and emotional stability of my family? Um, because it may not. You know, having a home doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be happy or that you're going to be stable. Maybe renting is better. Who knows? All right. Okay. Um, and that's a personal decision that people have to make. Is this, que- you know, is this purchase going to contribute to my financial stability? Maybe renting it this time due to the market that I'm in is better. Um, you know, maybe maybe this loan is going to be way more expensive uh, than than uh, than I need, uh, regardless of whether it's Islamic or not, right? Because many of the Islamic loans are more expensive than the conventional loans. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, there's an interesting. You know, is, is, is it going to be more harmful than some, some alternative? You know, because Ibn Taymiyyah, he has an interesting maxim. He says, you know, it's, it's impossible for God to permit something which is more detrimental than the things that he has forbidden. Right. So somebody says, well, what, you know, so it's impossible to say, yeah, cocaine is completely fine, but alcohols, you know, wine is forbidden the rationale behind the prohibition of wine, anything more than that would obviously be. So if you've got a, a financial structure that's structured, even if it's structured and you're being told that it's Islamic, another, you know, nod to the semantical arguments that we were talking about earlier. Um, 
if it's putting you off, if it's putting you in a worse place financially, is it really a good decision for you? Uh, and then thirdly is, you know, I tell people, on the day of judgment, nobody's going to stand between you and God. You're going to stand in front of God. You're on your own. You're going to answer for everything you've done in your life. Um, make a responsible, educated decision and be a, be willing to say, yes, I did this because I was caring for my family and creating a emotionally, socially, and financially stable environment for them. And if you, whatever decision you make, whatever product you go with, if you can answer that question, I think you'll be okay. So that's, yeah. and, I, and I, I imagine I mean, there's probably, there's probably a, a person of people, people who, who, who get that answer and who almost give a bigger look because they just wanted a straight up haram or halal like answer from you. Well, oh, oh man. I mean, some people just say, brother, stop being so long winded. Yeah. Just tell me yes or no. Exactly. <laughs> because, and, and I think that's to the point what I was trying to say earlier is that, which about why I think a lot of people, a lot of listeners will, li, li, uh, sorry, listeners will find what you're saying refreshing because you're, you're, you're reframing the conversation, right? Even in this context of answering that question, you're reframing it within this, within um, a, a broader framework of sort of a moral imperative rather than, okay, a purely legal answer. And I think that's, again, if I, I keep, exactly. I keep reusing the word, but refreshing. <laughs> it's like uh, it's like Sierra Mist. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Um, so, so Joe, I, I I know we've gone. I, I we, we we went a little bit, uh, or I think we, we spent a lot of time talking about that. But I I do I, I don't want to. I'd be remiss not to talk about some of the other adventures that you are involved with. So, uh, um, maybe flash for, maybe fast forwarding a little bit into. Uh, something I know that you wrote on recently. Um, so you were, uh, I, I guess, yeah. Well, why don't you kind of, you know, take it from there? I mean, which which thing that I read? The, the thing oh, about, <laughs> I'm sorry. Thing about using Beatles in in in, uh, in Starbucks coffee? No, 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 not that one. <laughs> not that wonderful piece. Um, <laughs> so no, I, I was referring specifically to your involvement or you being asked by the Ted Cruz camp to. Um, sort of educate them about, about Islam. And then you recently wrote a piece about how um, you didn't feel that <laughs> they didn't learn anything at all based on Ted Cruz's comments about uh, wanting to monitor Muslim neighborhoods. Oh, yeah, yeah. So the piece was picked up by Alternet. Um, they have a project called Project Gray Zone, uh, which tracks issues dealing with Islam. And I personally don't like the term Islamophobia, but, you know, okay, um, but you know, but Islamophobia and Muslims in the in the in the West and things like that. And then from there, it was picked up by Salon um, and uh, and and uh, distributed by Salon as well. Um, you know, I I had uh, I had been invited by friends of the Cruz family uh, who are Muslims um, to to uh, you know to coffee and uh, myself and other you know Muslims in the community. And uh, they wanted to talk about, you know, a number of things. And um, they wanted to talk, you know, they wanted somebody that was a specialist in Sharia, somebody that knew about Islamic law that could speak to them. And, um, you know, we had a very long conversation that night uh, about these issues. And uh, uh, it was a bit difficult, you know, to get the point across when you're in a, you know, you're in a, a group setting of trying to speak in a balanced academic fashion. I think the point that I tried to drive home was that we have Muslims that are very austere and conservative. We have Muslims that are very liberal. And we, as a Muslim community, um, all inclusive, don't need the government or any government, you know, any politician, de defining our faith for us. Um, but what we do need is, as a, is a candidate that will help protect our religious free freedoms and religious liberties regardless of the level of practice that we that we adhere to and it was you know his statements after the the attacks in in Belgium that uh that that made me kind of you know I felt obliged to write about the experience because to advocate you know monitoring uh muslim neighborhoods is ridiculous on just so many levels it's ridiculous on the level of what the hell is a Muslim neighborhood, right? Right. 
<laughs> what Muslim, you know, like, okay, I've got like two Muslims that live on my street, but I've also got like three Hindu Hindus, uh, four Buddhists, a couple of Catholics, you know, probably an atheist or two. So, you know, is this a Muslim neighborhood or a Hindu neighborhood? Am I safe or am I not? Um, and, and then, you know, Ted Cruz himself, you know, his father fled Cuba at the time when the government was patrolling the neighborhoods for dissidents. Right. You know, he's, you know, it, it just, it doesn't make sense for, um, for him to advocate for this. Uh, and I just felt obliged to kind of get that message out there. I mean, it's it's kind of interesting because I mean, what what Cruz said was uh, I mean, it was obviously problematic. But what I've seen, what what I've found almost more troubling is how people have engaged with it in a variety of different ways, including on the left, where you have people saying, you know, if we patrol Muslim neighborhoods, then they'll, you know, we're going to turn them extreme. You know what I mean? There's this this notion that like. American Muslims are like one bad experience away from from just going off. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, and in in you know, I've noticed that too, and that 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 sentiment is almost always coupled with you know we need them to, we need we need them to be on the front lines of combating radical Islam in the right. mosques and with right. the imams. You know, uh, hold on, you know most mosques in America don't even have imams. <laughs> Secondly, you know, I mean, statistically, people that go to the mosque are, you know, less susceptible to, to radicalization than if they do. So there's this this general like cultural, you know, assumption or this assumption about what being a Muslim is, you know, culturally uh, that really stings, and that the only way a Muslim really vindicates oneself is by uh, you know, fighting in the U.S. Air, you know, the U.S. Armed Forces, and that's that's really the only context in which the news media will talk about Muslims in a positive light. There are plenty of Muslims that fight in the military. I mean, for me, all respect. I mean, I come from a military family. Father was in Vietnam. Stepfather, Persian Gulf. Grandfather, you know, grandfathers, World Wars and Korea. You know, uh, brother-in-law, Army Ranger. You know, two tours in Iraq and Afghanistan best friends who are Muslim <laughs> that did the same thing. Uh, but I don't believe that it's the government's place to tell me that the only way I'm, I'm legitimate as an American or dedicated to the American ideal is if I've joined the, Uni- the United States Armed Forces. It's, I mean, at its, its face value, it's just such a false proposition. And then unfortunately, there's no one challenging that. And even many of our are our Muslims that are given FaceTime as few and far in between as they are, don't challenge it or, or even buy into it. Well, I mean, and I mean, to that point, what do you think, how, how should that false dichotomy be engaged with by, by people within the Muslim community? Um, you know, there's, there's a certain level of, of always having to explain oneself that becomes extremely tiring. And, um, you know, it, it seems, it seems almost like, you know, I, I actually was thinking about this today because, you know, for, for people who are very public in their engagement, um, outside of their own communities, you know, I know I have a friend who's a realtor and so he's rubbing elbows with, everybody you can think of in the city, right? Um, from common people to business people to city officials to, because he's on that level of engagement with society. Is He's very passionate about anytime something happens to make a public announcement, let people know this is not who we are. And so I, I get that need to do that, but how much of that kind of feeds into the the stereotypes that people have about Muslims uh, and what they what they actually really do think and believe, you know, are they this as you mentioned, like this powder keg that's just gonna, you know, don't disrupt them or they're they're gonna go off. Um, right. You know, I, I I personally have not kind of, you know, I, I personally in my personal life, I I, I don't necessarily um, 
I don't subscribe to the idea of apologizing for what other people have done. Um, you know, I definitely condemn certain forms of actions. This is one of the things that I said that night with the cruise campaign as well, when we, we got on the subject of radical Islamic terrorism, right? And I said, you know, it's, it's shameful that American politicians are harping on the issue of radical Islamic terrorism and not just talking about violent crime in general, because more Americans have been killed by suprem white supremacist groups than they have by what is being framed as radical Islamic terrorism, ra radical Islamic terrorists. So if politicians want to be truthful and they want to be constitutional and they want to be you know, defend, you know, defending people's freedoms, then they should just take a position that, that, that talks about the crime and doesn't stigmatize the communities that criminals belong to. Right. Or, or if we're going to talk about, you know, keeping Americans safe, then how about gun violence, right, in America? I mean, more, you know, the, like the numbers, like the number of people that are killed every year because of, violence, uh, you know, due to uh, the, the sort of lax gun control laws that we have in, in the country, um, you know, far, 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 far outnumbers anything that global terrorism or what have you, you know. Or uh, domestic terrorism or anything, yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, you know, I joked the other day that I think that the the only key to, 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 to reasonable gun control in the United States would to be start, will, will be to start in a Muslims for open carry movement. <laughs> and then people will be motivated like they were motivated in the 70s with the Black Panthers to implement gun control. I mean, in California, that's how gun control came into play. Um, You're yeah. absolutely right. Yeah, right here in Oakland. Yeah, yeah. The, 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 the Reagan administration, that was, it was the one that pushed for it because the Panthers showed up on the state capital with rifles and exercising their constitutional rights. Um, you well, hey, you're in Texas. Uh, oh, you know, open carry is now the law of the land. So, you know, maybe you can start to start that movement. Not you. In, not, I don't mean you in particular. I just mean my fellow, uh, my, 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 yeah, my, my old Texans. Texan friends. Yeah. I mean, I, I personally, um, you know, I certainly support the right to own a, a firearm. I think that responsible ownership is the duty of everybody that that does take that right upon themselves. Or, you know, to the, after you have a right, you have responsibilities with those rights. Um, you know, myself, I, I, I personally don't own a firearm. Um, and, you know, having a home with children, I don't think that it's, that, that it's uh, uh, wise. Um, but at the, at the same time, um, you know, I, I do believe that it's a, that it's a right, but it's one that, you know, it's, it's very difficult to, 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 to navigate, you know, this whole open carry. And I don't know if you guys have it out there, but, you know, open carry on campus. Are you, are Zeki, are you dealing with that right now? Uh, not so much. Okay. Cause we, cause you know, uh, teaching at Prairie View, we, you know, it's been implement. you know, there's been notices sent to businesses and universities that students have the right to, to carry on campus. Sure. Um, the problem is, is that a lot of campuses have early learning centers. We have an elementary school attached to our campus. So, you know, how do you, how do you set the boundaries for those things and where's the greater public good? And uh, it's a, it's a conversation that, you know, is really bewildering where, where, you know, the greater public good is in allowing people to carry guns on, you know, in places of education, but the greater public good is not in providing affordable health care to everyone in the nation. Uh, it just, to me, it seems like a recipe for disaster. Yeah, indeed. Um, so, too, uh, I, I guess uh, we've been, uh, we, we've taken a lot of your time, Joe, and it's been a fascinating conversation so far, um, and we'd love to just continue, but just for the sake of time and our, and uh, probably the attention span of our listeners, uh, tell us maybe uh, a little bit about where people can find your writings, uh, where people can engage you, um, seek you out. Yeah, so um, my website kind of, you know, has all of the links that, um, you know, for social media accounts and other sites that I write on. So joebradford.net uh, link, you know, to my academia.edu for my writings, Facebook and Twitter feeds. Um, and uh, muslimmoneyguide.com is another uh, that I write at and that will be, you know, being turned into a book. 
Um, so, you know, I mean, yeah, JoeBradford.net is kind of the hub for everything. And, uh, you know, I'm always open to hearing from people. People have questions. I have a question module on my site. If somebody wants to ask a question anonymously or, uh, or um, you know, they want to – it's going to reach me regardless whether they give me their name or not. And I'll, the answer will, will reach them. Obviously, if you ask me a question like, you know, can I eat, you know, Skittles, uh, I'm probably not going to answer that um, because <laughs> – I think that you can probably find other resources, but if it's a specialized question or one of, of uh, pressing need that I, you know, I'm always glad to be of service. Well, great. Uh, and, and then do you also like tweet? Uh, are you, are you on social media a whole lot? Yeah, I, I'm on Twitter. Uh, I, for the last couple of months, I've, I've slowed down on Twitter just because of, I've been launching a, uh, a new business. Um, it's Islamic estate planning uh, tool online. Um, it'll be called my will see ya, M Y W A S S I Y A H dot com. And, um, so I've kind of slowed down on social media, but quite honestly, a lot of my Twitter stuff is like really, man, is like really banal. And, 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 you know, it's, I, I kind of look at Twitter as like the backyard, you know, it's where you, you know, you joke and you play around. So if somebody sees, you know, something that's a bit irreverent or, um, not at all serious, uh, th that is definitely going to be on Twitter. But I have a Facebook page as well that, that I post to. Right, right. So like movie reviews, things like that, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm still I'm still extremely hurt by Zeki's review of Batman versus Superman, but <laughs> I was I was joking with friends the other day. I was like, I'm gonna post the review online and all of the all of the retorts that people had about the movies, like, you know, why did uh, why did you know Lois run back to the, the bus station? And no one had spoken to her about going to get the spear. And, you know, this is a continuity error. I was just going to, you know, answer every single answer on the page to like the 50, th 50 some things are just going to be because it's a movie. <laughs> because it's a movie. <laughs> and I know it's like very irreverent to Zeki because he's, he's a, I, I do enjoy your movie reviews a lot. But, oh, thank uh, you. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, I thought it was a fun movie. It's the best movie, no, but it was a fun movie. Well, that's a good place to leave it because otherwise we'll launch into an hour long debate about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Destruction of Batman v Superman, yeah. Oh, yeah. For, for my thoughts on that, you can listen to the movie film podcast episode, whatever, 92 or 3 or whatever it is. Okay, there, great. I'm going to check that out. Yeah, that's like my hour long uh, thoughts on, on Batman v Superman. But you know, the, the, I mean, just as a, as an aside before we go, I think it's really important to. And I actually gave a I gave a chutzpah based on the Man of Steel movie one time. Oh wow! And I covered it was interesting. I covered those issues of salvation in that in that chutzpah um, because I think that you know engaging with popular culture. One of my there's a book series out. It's like Philosophy and Mad Men, Philosophy and Game of Thrones. You know. Sure. Um, you know, a lot of people, that's that's where they're learning about philosophy and theology and, you know, ideas of general interest. And so it's important to engage with uh, with the arts and understand them, um, to understand society as a whole. Oh, absolutely. And, I mean, this is, an, again, another conversation. But, but uh, you know, you, you think about something like, the you know, uh, this is a little bit more dated and not as timely as, say, Batman v Superman or Game of Thrones or whatever. But, like, you know, C.S. Lewis's writings, right? Um, you know, and, and he's talking about some seriously heavy, like, or, or his writing is laden with, like, heavy Christian theology and, 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 and you know, Christ symbols galore and you name it, right? And, yeah. uh, but, 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 but his writing for a general audience that are just consuming the stuff has a great fantasy and fairy tale. But and it's not so it. in your face. It's not like I'm punching you in the face with my faith. But, right. But and the so undertones are there. A good friend of mine who, who also, you know, sort of writes and is an author and stuff. I mean, you know, one, one of the questions that he – one of the sort of challenges, if you will, was is that like, you know, where's our Muslim sort of CS CS Lewis that's sort of talking about stuff like, you know, like like the talking about things that are ripe within Muslim theology, but presenting it in a way that's not like you said, that's just you know, it's 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 there, but it's not, you know, drawing attention to itself and it's not a book on theology as it were. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean it, it it definitely has a prof profound effect. I know personally myself 
in my personal life as a kid, um, you know, I was one of those, you know, white kids growing up in the suburb thinking that Africa was a country. And um, it wasn't until I heard Stetsasonic's, you know, A-F-R-I-C-A, uh, that I actually knew about African history. Um, and that was, I think I was like nine years old or 10 years old. So the, you know, the power of these, of the symbolism that's found in culture just can't be popular culture. Can't be, can't be denied. It's super important to, to engage. I'm, I'm not saying, you know, I'm definitely not like the type of like, you know, every imam should be like a concert promoter. I'm, I'm not, I'm not like that. Right. <laughs> But I do think that we have to engage, you know, proactively with cult- the culture that's around us. We even find the Prophet Ali Salaam, po- you know, quoting the popular poets of his time and that's right. telling people this was a, this is the true truest statement that a poet has ever said. But the next statement that he, the next line that he said is not. Uh, uh, and, and you know, we're giving a fair assessment of how to navigate these things and in, in, in as just another form of consumption. Fascinating, exactly. Well, I, I want to have you back on just to talk about that kind of stuff because that, 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 that's the stuff I'm really interested in. Is this That'd be whole, great. Like, yeah, that would uh, be great. Cultural production. That, that's, a, that's a great conversation to have. So, um, But, again, thanking you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Joe, for taking the time out. Um, I know it's late. Uh, we're recording pretty late here on the West Coast, let alone there in Houston. So thanks for uh, staying up late for us. My pleasure. My pleasure. Yeah, Thank you for having uh, me on, guys. Listeners for, uh, for the, uh, you know, uh, another episode, and uh, we hope you uh, send comments our way, questions, comments. Uh, you can reach us at diffusecongruence at gmail.com. You can uh, hit us up on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash diffusecongruence, and uh, we look forward to engaging you there. Uh, if you do, download us off of iTunes or what, Stitcher Radio. Please do leave us a review or a star rating. We do appreciate that as well. Zeki, any final thoughts? That's it for me. All right. Well, thank you. And uh, that concludes another episode of Diffuse Confluence. Uh, uh, Diffuse Confluence. We look forward yeah, I to I let you do the outro one time. <laughs> this is what happened. <laughs> That's right, Zeki. Uh, uh, we'll leave that in there. So, um, But, yeah, uh, that concludes another episode of uh, Diffuse Confluence. Thank you for listening. Uh, we look forward to having you join us next time. <laughs>